Hi. Um, sorry, Helen, when you've got ears as big as mine, you feel a little bit self-conscious with these things. Um, so I, uh, my name's Klaus Halcroft. I work at Bloomberg. Um, I work on the cloud infrastructure team there. Um, we run uh, numerous uh, uh, OpenStack clusters at Bloomberg. Um, the actual production code that we use, we'll, we'll look at it a little bit, is available on GitHub. If you go to github.com slash Bloomberg, you can see exactly what we're running in production, soup to nuts. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit today about how we went about upgrading all these live production clusters. Um, so I've been asked this a couple of times, actually. We're uh, sponsoring the, the Dev Lounge. If you want to see a Bloomberg terminal, you can go down there and, and see one in, you know, doing its thing. And I've been asked this a few times, so I just put a slide up in case you haven't heard of Bloomberg or are a little bit unsure about what we do. If you go into almost any financial, large financial institution, um, <clears throat> you'll see a, a bunch of very high-octane people clustered around screens like this, you know, you traders and risk people and such and such, all sort of, you know, poking and, you know, making trades and doing things, you know. Um, <clears throat> that's the Bloomberg terminal. That is our core product, um, or more properly, the Bloomberg professional service. Um, <clears throat> which is essentially pretty much any financial data you want uh, and a lot of analysis. And I mean, if you go down there and have a look at uh, what we have, it's really quite amazing. But in addition to that and supplementing that, we have a lot of other products. Um, Bloomberg News is probably in most of your hotel rooms, Bloomberg Business Week. Um, we're also in a, a lot of other verticals, um, particularly law, sports, and government. Um, so we're branching out into, into other areas. Um, just to give you an idea of the kind of numbers we're dealing with, um, <clears throat> we have something like uh, 22 million instant messages a day, quarter of a, mil quarter of a billion, excuse me, messages a day. Um, we suck down about 10,000 feeds. I think that number's actually a little bit out of date now. Um, and we deal with, what's that, 50 billion ticks a day, at least. So <clears throat> what is the Bloomberg Cluster Private Cloud, or BCPC for short? Um, it's part of a much bigger cultural shift at Bloomberg um, towards a DevOps culture. To, you know, we all know what this is, um, to reduce our uh, developer, uh, the, the, the friction for, for product deployment, to reduce our turnaround to market. Um, you know, all these good things like machine provisioning as code. Um, we're an essential part of that um, with a private cloud component. Um, and when we were designing this, um, we had some very specific design goals in mind, um, we wanted to have a uh, complete automated install of an entire cloud stack, not just OpenStack, not just Ceph and OpenStack, but everything, soup to nuts, right the way from you know, provisioning the boxes, the actual hardware boxes, right the way through to monitoring and alerting and, and what have you. So if you go and look at GitHub, that's exactly what you get. You get everything we run, the entire stack. Um, each cluster in itself should be highly, act uh, highly available, active active, highly available. And we wanted to make it as simple as possible. We don't want you know, terribly complex uh, interdependencies, that things that can go wrong. So it's a, it's a simple design. And we also want to try to keep it as homogeneous as possible. What I mean by that is there isn't lots of like, special dedicated nodes for running just you know, MySQL or just you know, Nova or something like that. We have one stack, and then we just slice that stack for, you know, to add compute power. We'll have a look at that. Um, <coughs> and it was also designed, excuse me, to scale purely, linearly, purely horizontal scaling from a single node up to many hundreds. So you can run BCPC on one node on your laptop, or three nodes on your laptop, or you can run it in many hundreds, and it's exactly the same architecture. You don't change anything apart from just provision more nodes. And uh, one thing that's often overlooked in, uh, in environments such as ours is it has to be completely deployable in the absence of any internet whatsoever. So in a totally isolated environment. So we you know, ha have recipes to get apt mirrors and get everything you need to install this thing you know, in total isolation. So as I said, it's not just OpenStack. It's not just Ceph, but OpenStack. It's a whole lot. And these are the list of the technologies we use. I think it's fairly exhaustive. Um, rather than go through them in, in great detail, you can just go and look at our code on GitHub and, and have a play with it. Uh, to sort of graphically represent what, what it looks like, um, and I don't want to go through this in too much detail, but just so you get an idea of what we're, we're trying to upgrade, um, <clears throat> we have you know, obviously the host at the bottom on uh, Ceph um, as our storage layer that acts as both S3 storage and block storage. Uh, we have you know, gl uh, MySQL Galera and RabbitMQ clustered. And then we run um, the uh, OpenStack services in a sort of shared nothing architecture, and we front that with HAProxy and, and KeepAliveD. 
uh, said that we have one stack. Obviously, we don't run hundreds of Nova schedulers. Um, we have a reduced stack where we essentially just, for adding compute, where we just uh, slice off the, you know, the top layer of this and we just run Nova Compute and uh, Nova Networking. And we keep you know, everything else the same. We have a, well, obviously, we don't run MySQL there as well. We, the, the compute nodes not only contribute to, uh, to Nova Compute, but they also contribute their, their disks to the Ceph pool. Yeah, so uh, every, no every hardware node, if it has n disks, it will have one root partition, which is the, you know, the, uh, the OS, and then contributes n minus one to, to the Ceph pools. OK, so a little bit of a note about our development. Um, we do a release cycle that sort of tries to sort of match OpenStack's release cycle. We actually you know, call it Lisa slash Icehouse is our, our current you know, uh, production release. Uh, we're working on, on Juno. And that sort of comes out a few months, hopefully, after uh, after uh, each uh, you know OpenStack release. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, one thing to to note is that uh, you can actually run uh, an entire BCPC stack on your laptop. This laptop's running one. Um, you can just spin it up inside VMs. This is a three node. It's got one head node with the entire stack on it, and then two compute nodes and a bootstrap node, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So you can go to GitHub and just spin one of these up. So <clears throat> that's how we do the development. That's our stack, what we actually run in production. We have lots and lots of individual isolated clusters. So rather than have one large OpenStack cloud, we have lots and lots of smaller ones um, that live in like different network, um, in different networks in our, in our environment, but also, and of course, in different data centers. So each cluster is a, each network zone is mirrored in, of course, at least another data center. And by policy, we apply a policy where every app that runs on us at the platform layer has to be able to run on more than one data center. So it's, uh, it can fail over to the other side, no problem. <coughs> so how do we actually go about deploying it? We have a deployment node um, which we can push. You know, is this is the bootstrap node which we can push code into our Chef server. We can uh, control Cobbler, which we use for provisioning hardware. Um, and we can push you know, uh, new packages into our apt mirrors. And from there, we can also talk to our out-of-band management, so IPMI tools to, to talk to our out-of-band management. <coughs> so how do we go about upgrading this? So our policy is that we'll only ever upgrade one network segment in one data center at a time. Uh, so we always ensure that at least that network segment is available on the other, in another, at least another data center. And the week, because of our policy with our apps, it means that we can, they can just fail over to that other data center and, uh, and keep on running. But we do try and keep the, the downtime, any downtime, to an absolute minimum. So our target downtime is roughly one hour to upgrade a cluster to have the control plane back up and running. One thing that's important to note is we have a lot of data on our Ceph clusters, and we can't just like take that off and put it on tape every time we want to do an upgrade. So we have to keep all our Ceph data you know, live on the cluster and keep it safe. We can't just sort of blow everything away and, and start again. That's not really an option for us. What's your replication policy? Uh, we replicate within a cluster three times. We do not replicate across the river or across to another data center or anywhere else. So um, we have various options when trying to upgrade. We could try a rolling upgrade. When we did uh, Grizzly Havana, this wasn't really an option. Um, so we didn't design our upgrade procedure around that because it wasn't really available to us. We could just do an app get upgrade, but we do so many architectural changes. We, you know, when we're upgrading from our version, our, our stack from in uh, Grizzly to our stack in Havana, we've changed a lot of other things, not just OpenStack. We've changed, you know, made improvements to our own architecture, made improvements to our Ceph crush maps, et cetera, et cetera. So upgrade, upgrade isn't going to get us there. Um, <coughs> so rather than doing a lot of tedious mucking around with app get uninstalling stuff and reinstalling things and things like that, we just tend to wipe host and reinstall it. But we've got a lot, a lot of clusters to do. Actually, just out of curiosity, uh, how many people here have been personally responsible for upgrading OpenStack clusters? OK. When you're doing a, an individual cycle, how many independent clusters have you upgraded? You've raised your hand if you've done more than two. 
Raise your hand on more than five. Raise your hand on more than 10. Okay, right? So it has to be automated, right? You're not gonna do this like order 10 times you know, by hand. So um, we developed a workflow in Ansible um, that uh, runs through a cluster, one, two, three, to five. The number of nodes you actually do at any you know, upgrade at any particular moment depends on you know, what they're doing. Head nodes, I'd probably do one at a time. Worker nodes, I'm a bit more confident about. I'll do you know, three at a time. Depending on your Ceph crush map, if you feel comfortable doing a whole rack at a time, you do a whole rack at a time. Um, one important thing is that you have to run a bunch of functional checks before you start to upgrade a host and after you're done. The possibility of cascading failures is really kind of scary. Um, so if you've got all your checks in place and you've got all your motivation in place, you just sit back and relax and watch it roll through the cluster, right? Right? No. <laughs> so that's the uh, long periods of boredom, 2 a.m., sitting there watching your Ansible scripts running, 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 running. That's the long periods of boredom. A little note on, on state, um, so people understand. Of course, we're nuking individual hosts, but we're not going to wipe out the OSDs. The OSDs stay where they are. They're separate disks. They, uh, they live through the upgrade. And our cookbooks are written so that when you uh, bring back the, you know, the root partition, it will reincorporate those OSDs back into the Ceph cluster. So that all works rather nicely. So Ceph uh, maintains our images, our volumes, our S3, all our OpenStack you know, data. And then MySQL Galera, of course, is you know, the OpenStack database. Um, as I said, uh, Ceph generally does a pretty good job of reincorporating those OSDs without trouble. MySQL uh, lives, the database of MySQL lives on our root partition. So when you redeploy that, that head node, you lose that that uh, MySQL install, so you have to do an SST back into, into the one you've just deployed, which adds a little bit of time, depending on how big your database is. <clears throat> so sort of detail the plan, you know, what actually gets automated. Um, we take down, oops, seems to have got squashed a bit. We take down the control plane, first of all, it's sort of time zero, so this is the action, this is the impact it has on our tenants, and how long, you know, in the, in the uh, how long it takes. So we take down the cluster uh, VIP, that's the front layer. That basically means that at that point, our tenants can no longer control their VMs. The VMs are still there, they're still running, and they're still absolutely fine, but they can't spin any new ones up, destroy them, et cetera. And we also obviously disable Chef at that point. Um, <coughs> after that, we actually upload all our new code into, into Chef, you know, what we're, we're targeting, uh, you know, deploy new app to mirrors if we need to, et cetera, et cetera. Then we upgrade Ceph, Ceph if required. Not all of our upgrades require an upgrade in Ceph, but the Grizzly Hidalgo one did, um, for example. Uh, if we that, that's usually a pretty painless process. You just upgrade, upgrade Ceph, and uh, bounce all your Ceph, all your Mons, and then all your Hosties, and you're pretty much okay. Um, <coughs> upgrade MySQL. That usually goes pretty smoothly. Um, so you, because this thing is clustered, so you want to make sure that you, when you bring up the new host, you're in the same version as the, uh, the ones that you know, are keeping the data for you. So you have to do that before you actually start to re-image the, the new head nodes. And then you start repixing and reshefing your head nodes. So all this point, you probably, it depends on how big the cluster is, how big your database is, et cetera, et cetera. You're probably about 60 minutes in before you get your first head node back. And at that point, you've got your uh, control plane back, right? You've got a control plane available to your tenants. Now, you don't have any compute unless, of course, Nova networking, Nova networking and Nova compute is backwards compatible. Um, <clears throat> so the details of uh, what actually happens in that last stage is you IPMI off your server, re-enable Pixie booting, chef in a new OpenStack control plane. Uh, all the recipes, like I say, reincorporate uh, the OSDs, they rejoin the MySQL cluster, they rejoin the Rabbit cluster, everything's great, and then you do your DB sync, and the world is a fabulous place, right? <clears throat> the compute nodes, a little bit easier. Um, once you've got the fully operational control plane, um, you don't have anything to control, but now you can start to rip through your, your compute nodes and upgrade those in exactly the same way. And of course, they'll just rejoin the cluster. And at that point, your tenants now have new compute nodes to deploy. Now, if they're running VMs and they haven't terminated their VMs, if they're running VMs on those compute nodes, at that point, they'll get shut down. But of course, we're running all our stuff with boot from volume. 
So when the compute node comes back up, they can just actually basically take that volume and restart their VM if needs be. So <coughs> that's essentially what we're saying here. Um, so they get, they will get terminated. They'll get shut down when you, they, you happen to roll through their node if they don't terminate. We do tend to encourage people to terminate their VMs. It's just cleaner, um, and uh, they can bring it up on the other side of the river. It's it's not. You know, for our apps, it's not a particularly big deal. <coughs> so we're chasing, uh, chasing through our cluster, doing one head node at a time, doing three worker nodes at a time, and then before every iteration, we move on. We've got to check that everything's OK. You know, so some examples, is Ceph returned? Has MySQL been fully synced? Has Rabbit joined? You know, is there any errors on the functional checks? And then we, we can move forward. And at no point, we're risking any of our data. So as I said, this all works great. If your machines have been up for a year or something, they're hot, you bring them down, some of them don't come back. You know, some disks fail, whatever. So you have a, at this point, you have a choice to make. You've got a, a node that has maybe a, a root volume that is not going to come back. So you either bring that host down, down and out it from Ceph, let it migrate the data off, or you fix it in place and move on. You've just got to be a little bit aware of cascading failures that You've got maybe something wrong in your new recipes, and if you kept on going, you're going to end up with you know a rack and a half of completely balked nodes, and now you've got some data problems. So I generally stop when I hit the first or second error and go back and just check that I'm not doing anything silly, um, and then make a decision about what I'm going to do about that particular host. And it's case by case basis. There's always a, always problems. The the Ceph attack. Um, so as I said, we're not just upgrading OpenStack, we're upgrading Ceph, we're also upgrading our architecture. So we make you know, improvements to our crush maps, we make improvements to how we uh, lay out the data on the disks, et cetera, et cetera. So that obviously has to get sheft in when we, uh, when we uh, bring up a, a new head node. It's going to apply those changes to the crush maps. So there are some things you have to be really careful of here. Um, for example, when we went from Dumpling to Firefly, there's this rather innocuous little um, uh, tunable that we just put straight into our uh, into our uh, into our crush maps, um, which it, it says right there in the documentation, it causes every single byte on your cluster to move, um, which is great when you've just done one head node, you've got a control plane back and no compute, and now your entire cluster is trying to rebalance. So you have to be quite careful on how you manage that. The way we do that now is we have switches in our recipes where you can basically say, you know what. I know that this crush map is not how you want it to be ultimately, but just leave it alone for now, and we'll come back and we'll do it later. Let's get you know the, everything back up and running, and then we'll you know apply some those crush map changes, those uh, tunable changes later. <coughs> the uh, database snafu. So obviously you've got a backup for your database, right? It's the first thing you do, but then you're you know you're doing ten or so clusters. At some point, you're going to have a database drop and you're halfway through a big sync, and now you have to blow it all away and reload the database and start again. So that's uh, another thing that has gone wrong a few times. Um, <coughs> the deprecation warnings that you get, uh, I don't know if you, you all got these when you go from Grizzly Havana, those will come back and bite you in the butt later, so you better take care of those during that upgrade process. And there's also a, some... BCPC related changes like we changed from going from one large pool for uh, block storage to uh, SSDs and HDDs separated out um, in the G2H uh, upgrade. So you have to go into the database and actually make some, some changes related to our own architecture. So um, that is essentially how we do it. We call it the rolling nuclear update. Um, we just roll through the cluster, blow one away at the time, maintain the state of the data as we go. Because of our policy uh, applied at the app layer, we can have that out short outage at a control plane level in any particular one data center and let it fail over to one of the others. Um, it actually works really well, and it works. I think it will work, continue to work. Um, hopefully, in the future, we can have you know that uh, backwards compatibility so that the VMs that are already up when we bring up the control plane will be able to still apply some controls to those and do some live migrations. Um, let's let's hope. Uh, <coughs> doing it this way, we we don't expose any of our data. We don't expose uh, any of the the Ceph pools to any potential data loss as long as we do all those functional checks. And of course, we just completely automated this because there's no way I'm doing this 10 times by hand. 
the only downside to this option is that you will take a short, layer, short outage at your control plane level. Um, and of course, every single VM would have to be restarted if you're in an environment where you, you don't have this failover option. You'd have to essentially go back and restart those VMs as you go through the cluster. So that's the downside. So that's it. Any questions?